Okay. Um, I think we're on time, so uh, we're going to start. We have a, a lot of content. So, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to talk. This is the talk about lessons learned about scaling yarn to 40,000 machine. My name is Ronnie Bird. I'm a principal software engineer manager at Microsoft, and I'll be joining today with uh, Hitesh and Sarvesh, who's going to give some detailed uh, about some of these lessons. So let me start by saying, uh, which one, where is this uh, large cluster? And today, I think we're the largest cluster in the world. Uh, it's called Cosmos. And Cosmos is a platform, a big, big data platform that we use inside of Microsoft to run big data processing. And to give you a rough sense of the numbers, uh, Cosmos is composed of multiple data centers around the world. Each one is at least 40,000 machines. We stored a bunch of exabytes in here uh, and processed many petabytes over the day, which results in roughly half a million jobs per day, uh, which pushes uh, about 2 million containers per hour. We like to run these data centers really hot, so utilization is extremely high on these data centers. And because this is used as a platform for our developers inside of Microsoft, there's a certain expectations of availability and reliability that we have to keep that everyone uh, expects on a cloud service. And so today the talk is about this journey. We move this existing service, this massive service that's used across Microsoft over to Yarn. And the reason we did that is obviously we wanted, we got a lot of feedback that people wanted to start using op more open source tools. We use a uh, proprietary open source, um, sorry, a proprietary application I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about. But in addition to that, there's obviously a force multiplier when you're using open source software. You get benefits of the community contributing, looking at your bugs, and also being able to collaborate with them. And so we wanted to be part of that community as we continue to increase our platform. So for those who don't know, I'll introduce you to some uh, important concept of Cosmos and, uh, and because you have to understand and get an intuition of the implication that that had for our journey uh, to get Yarn installing it. The first one is, I kind of mentioned, we, ins we run uh, a lot of different types of application, not only Reef and co Reef Code, Spark, Hive, but we run our own AMs, which are called Scope, and I'll tell you a little bit more in details about that in a second. The important thing that we had through this migration, basically, is we had to keep the existing uh, legacy system running as we move them over. The other interesting constraint is we run both SLA and non-SLA job in the same data center. These data centers are pretty huge. We don't partition it in any form or shape. And so uh, we have to try to keep both of them running. And the way we do that is we give our customer this concept of a virtual cluster. A virtual cluster is nothing more than a logical concept that sets an upper limit of how many concurrent containers can run for that particular job. Obviously, these virtual clusters are mapped to, lo it's a logical concept, they're not tied to physical machines. The physical machines are shared across all the tenants, and if there's capacity that's not being used, it's, it gets used uh, by some other tenant for some other reason. So the last one is, I don't think this is unique to us, and I think it's uh, very common to everyone who's running a large data center, is we have to maximize both COGS and try to reduce latency at the same time. So this forces us to some of the design principles. So the, one of the reasons our data centers are so big is because we want to minimize data movement as much as possible. We also put a premium on data locality, and we'll tell you a little bit about that in a second, but that really becomes incredibly important to us. The other thing is we have metrics and telemetry to really keep an eye on our cogs. We look at CPU, I.O., through uh, bandwidth and everything all the time to make sure that we don't leave money on the table, especially at this large scale. It implies a lot of millions of dollars if we do that. So let me talk to you a little bit about Scope uh, and how it's slightly different than some of the other applications that you are may maybe familiar with, like uh, Spark and Hive. So this diagram just represents in the bottom, you get like a basic representation of a cluster with some racks and NMs. And on the upper right, you have the logical view of what Scope will see when it starts running. And so the y-axis will be, you know, how many containers can be run at a given point in time. You have this line that scope respects, which basically says you cannot go above this number of containers at any given point in time. That ties back to that VC concept I explained a, 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 go, a minute ago. And obviously you have time. So when a scope AM job gets launched the first time around, scope see how many containers it can run. 
it goes and then dispatches a wave of containers to the cluster. After those containers are finished, because normally everyone finishes at the same time, there's another big wave that comes in and makes a request to other sets of machines. So the first characteristic is scopes submit these containers in kind of waves. And these waves can be somewhat big at times. It can be up to 2,000 on any given time for just a single application. As I mentioned, we have multiple applications running at the same time. So in order to achieve the SLA that we promised everyone, what we do is for each one of that maximum line that we give each application, it's basically less than the total available capacity that we have in the cluster. If anyone has run a cluster, immediately you'll recognize this leads to underutilization, and that conflicts with the previous statement I made that we want to run this cluster is really hot. And so the way we solve that particular problem is by using Mercury. So Mercury was introduced uh, last year by uh, Sriram and Costas. And one of the concepts that we use for Mercury that's been really important for us is this concept of opportunistic containers. Opportunistic containers are containers that get dispatched directly to the NM, and, and the NM makes a local decision to do if there's enough capacity to start the container immediately. Otherwise, it gets queued. And so I re I'll refine a little bit the diagram that I had before where you have all these containers and you have a maximum capacity. So now scope can decide after it ex gets to its peak of, of capacity, it can start firing these opportunistic containers. It's kind of the graphical representation of what opportunistic containers will look like. And so once the guaranteed container finished, scope has a choice. He can either go and say, give me the next wave of guaranteed containers, or he can say for the opportunistic containers that he already dispatched, he can come and say, just uh, promote them or change them from opportunistic over to guaranteed. So one, if there are collisions, because they'll, they'll happen as opportunistic containers start on the box, in order to avoid those collisions, if a guaranteed container comes, we actually pause the opportunistic container in the box. Uh, there's an open JIRA out there that Hitesh actually contributed, and we're looking for feedback for that and, and committing it soon. Uh, and this helps us preserve COGS. We don't want to lose work or anything. Just to give you a rough sense of how our data centers are running, these are two graphs that represent two data centers. One is a test uh, cluster. The other one is more of a production one. Uh, we're running incre incredibly hot. Most of the computers are running at 100% CPU utilization almost. So these clusters are really, really hot all the time uh, just by using this technique. If, just to give you a graphical representation of this, uh, scope AM is represented here, and you have your RM and NM. So the first thing that normally all applications do today is an allocate call to YarnRM. Uh, the YarnRM will then put it in the pending queue, and after a scheduler tick, it will move it out to the allocated queue once there's enough capacity, and on the next heartbeat, it will respond back. Uh, opportunistic container gets directly launched and responded automatically uh, because YarnRM doesn't uh, care. It's just an NM decision at that point. And then Scope also can say, I'm going to promote opportunistic container over to guarantee container. As I said, if there's a contention, an opportunistic will move out from the running queue over to opportunistic queue, and when the, capa the space gets available again, it will get pushed back uh, in. In this diagram, you also see there's this component called Scope Auxiliary Service that we run on the NM. It's a feedback loop over to Scope to tell him uh, how uh, the load in the cluster is in order to be able to make better locality decisions and what is the expected time are going to be. So the important thing is not, and from this diagram, not only the behavior of how do we do opportunistic containers, to understand that because we're using this technique, in aggregate, the number of QPSs that we submit to Scope RM are actually pretty high can be up to 10,000 QPSs across the entire cluster. The last thing I want to talk about uh, scope is how sensitive it is to latency. So even though scope today is mainly a batch system, if we do a histogram of all the container runtime, you'll see that we have the big runtimes, like 30 minutes, an hour containers. But we also have extremely short containers, like 10 to 20 seconds if we I think last, last I checked, more than 50% of all the containers were running less than 20 seconds. So that means that any delay in this path that I just explained, the allocate, the response, and the start container will produce, have a big implications in terms of performance. And not only that, scope is smart enough to figure out if it's waiting for too long, he has to start routing it to other machines in order to avoid that delays. 
And if there's too many of these rerouting, he will consider it the job has failed. And so we have to uh, be, care be careful of that. And the other interesting tidbit is we kind of run the math at one point, and 20 seconds in terms of opportunity cost is equivalent to several millions of dollars of wasted time. So uh, we really take uh, good care of making sure that latencies are low. And finally, because of this, uh, and because Scope is also extremely smart about figuring out locality decisions, so uh, because it has a lot of built-in optimization inside, he can detect whether a join uh, comes after the previous stages, and so he just does not go and ask for containers before he knows exactly where to schedule it. Uh, for group buys, it can act, uh, rack uh, locality um, on specific machines. And so because of all of this, and he has all this view through this aux service of the entire cluster, he makes like very opinionated decisions about what locality he wants. And so this is really important for our particular workload that has some implication on some of the findings that we had on Yarn. I think uh, most, most people have the same topology, so really rack and node for us are very similar. Uh, off switch is definitely bad. And so the two takeaways that I want you to remember from this one is container allocations need to be really short, and we quantify that by saying it has to be less than five seconds at the 95 percentile. That's kind of the SLA that we give our, uh, our applications. And the final one is this you know, very opinionated node locality uh, desire. So node locality is very important to us across the data center. So with that, uh, today, what we're going to cover are two lessons that we learned from all of these constraints. The first one is how did we scale Yarn to deal with these constraints in general, and what did we find? And the next one is uh, how do we scale uh, Yarn to even larger scale? So for that, I would like to invite Hitesh. Hey, thanks, Roni. Hey, everyone. I'm Hitesh Sharma. I will be talking about some of the scalability challenges that we had with uh, Yarn RM, what problems we had, how we are fixing them, and then share some numbers. Before we get, in, get into that, I want to highlight some main characteristics of the scope workload that make things interesting from, my, from a Yarn RM scale perspective. Like Ronnie called out, scope can span across uh, thousands of machines, so the number of allocations that we received are a much magnitude higher than we would have in other workloads. Also, scope can uh, see the entire cluster and picks up the machine where it wants to run. So it's important for us to respect uh, that decision and uh, give that node if there is capacity or space on that node. We also have to ensure that the container allocation latencies are below five seconds at the 95th percentile because that relates into job slowness and, in worst case, failures. So what are the problems that we had? As we started to run scope jobs on our clusters, what we were notice, noticing is that some big jobs can actually overwhelm YANRM. What I mean by overwhelming YANRM is the allocation latencies would start to go up, then locality would become bad, and eventually YANRM would just stop allocations altogether. Now, the other challenges we had is any kind of scale testing on a real cluster is an expensive process. Also, we felt that there was a lack of telemetry, like knowing what's happening inside the scheduler for us was not straightforward. So here is one uh, example of uh, a case where Yarn RM could not allocate containers fast enough. In this particular setup, we had uh, a test cluster with 3,000 nodes. We were running uh, Hadoop 2.7.1. We used capacity scheduler with a single key from a scheduling perspective. And what you're, not what you're seeing here is that on the y-axis, you have the number of containers. X-axis is time. And the red line is showing the number of pending containers. So the, these are the containers that were requested from YANRM, but they never got allocated. And the blue line there is showing the number of allocated containers, containers that YANRM was able to give back. The thing to note about this thing is that uh, we had enough capacity in the cluster to run all the jobs. So what we would expect to see is that the red line should never go above. YANRM should be able to allocate the containers as they are being requested. But because of the rate at which we were asking for them, RM could not keep up and then just goes in this loop, and we have this hockey stick kind of a curve that comes up. So before we go further, I want to quickly recap how scheduling works in the capacity scheduler at a very, very high level. At a high level, you have these application masters which are sending allocations to YAN RM, and when RM receives the allocations, they go in this pending queue. Now, Scheduling in the capacity scheduler is driven from heartbeats. You have these node managers that are also heartbeating to RM. And when Yan RM receives a heartbeat, it takes a lock on the queue and says, okay, what can I satisfy on this particular node out of the queue? 
And uh, if there is a request for a container on that node, then RM does the allocation. Otherwise, it will just look at the next item in the queue. The interesting thing here is that all the node heartbeats are coming, and we are looking at all the all the requests in the queue. So you take a log, you go, you take a you take a log, and you look at all the node heartbeats one after another. So there is a sequential thing that's happening. Now, what are the bottlenecks? What we found is that this processing of node heartbeats one after another is not a very scalable way to do things. There are some uh, implications because of the sequence that we take a, a log and process heartbeats after one another. At the same time, we found that counting of heartbeats to decide whether it's okay to go from a, a node to a rack or anywhere else in the cluster is actually a little hard to tune. One, because our cluster sizes are always changing, so we don't know what the right amount of node heartbeats after which we can go down to rack or anywhere else in the cluster. And secondly, as you count these heartbeats, there is more work that the scheduler ends up doing, and that slows down. You can question, though, why counting heartbeats is actually causing the scheduler to not process these incoming requests fast enough. And uh, we had the same question, and we did quite a bit of profiling to get the answer. What we found is that when these heartbeats are coming, a capacity scheduler is creating these resource objects that are immutable and backed by a protobuf, so they are quite heavy. Now, if you have 1,000 requests in the queue and you have 3,000 nodes heartbeating, you are going to create about 3 million of these every second. Now, that's a lot of objects that you create, and numbers start to add up very quickly. At the same time, we learn that log4j is synchronous by default. Now, there is some log contention that's happening, and to add to it, in our clusters, we have a lot of drive contention. So combined with that, the logging itself was becoming expensive. There is one other property of scope where uh, when we request for a container, we request for one container on a machine at a time. And now imagine if you have multiple jobs running, they can all come and say, I need a container on that machine. The capacity scheduler, on the other hand, is going to do one allocation per heartbeat. So if there are five requests outstanding, one request will get satisfied in the first heartbeat, and the fifth one will have to wait till the fifth heartbeat. So that doesn't play well with our workload and our scenarios. OK. So, like I said earlier, we run Hadoop 2.7.1, and given the characteristics of the workload that we are running, we were running into these problems. Everything else is okay, but when you have a workload where you are going to make a lot of allocations, you're super sensitive about latency and locality, things are not quite working out. So we made some improvements. We are aware of the improvements that are coming in uh, Hadoop 3.0 in terms of going towards scheduling outside of heartbeats and also some of the log contention that's being removed, and we look forward to using that. But here are some of the things we tried, and they gave us some good results. The first thing we did was to go towards uh, something called scheduler key pruning. The idea being that when the node heartbeat comes, you do not look at everything that's there in the queue. You look at what requests can actually be satisfied by that uh, node or that rack. And that way you eliminate a bunch of the extra elements that are there in the queue and you avoid looking at them. The second thing we did was to go towards time-based decay for locality. What it means is instead of counting heartbeats to, re to decide that we should go from node to rack or anywhere else in the cluster, we now wait on time. So there are two implications. One, it's much easier for us to tune that. We can say, hey, if after three seconds the request is not satisfied, you allocate on the rack. Or if another three seconds have passed and the request is still not satisfied, you allocate anywhere else in the cluster. And also, now because of this, we do not have to count all the heartbeats and we don't have to create all those expensive objects. So we again reduce the amount of work that's happening inside the lock when we are processing the node heartbeats. We also switched over to using the async log4j appender. That again reduces the log contention and the discontention that happens in the cluster. The team has been continuously working upon adding a lot of metrics. So we now have a much better visibility into what's happening inside the scheduler. We track allocation latencies, promotion latencies at the different percentiles. And that allows us to keep the lights on for the service without really killing ourselves. And uh, we'll have a screenshot of some of the tools that we use uh, for tracking these metrics. So here are some uh, test results. These results were uh, collected from a cluster where we had 4,000 nodes. We had uh, Yarn RM getting heartbeats from node managers and application masters every one second. We were using the log4j async appender here. Now, 
before we did anything, uh, the first stage shows the improvements or the numbers that we had. We had allocation latencies at about uh, 10 seconds. We could barely sustain a load of 500 allocations per second, and uh, locality was quite bad. With some of the changes we did, we saw some improvements. For instance, by limiting what, by limiting what outstanding requests each node heartbeat looks at, we could actually sustain a much higher load of about uh, 2,000 allocations per second. At the same time, our allocation latencies fell to four seconds at the 95th percentile, and the node locality also improved. Taking it further, we tried the next thing of saying, okay, let's decay locality based on time. So instead of counting heartbeats, we now say, hey, it's been three seconds and the request is not satisfied, so maybe let's go to the rack. And that showed more improvement, especially in the terms of how much load can we sustain. Now we can go to 3,000 allocations per second, and the latencies have also fallen a little bit because of that. So here again, we have the pending and allocated graph. On the left is what I showed you guys earlier, but on the right is the same workload that we ran, but this time we had the improvements made. So you can see RM or YAN RM has no issues in keeping up with the rate at which we are requesting containers. Things are moving along quite nicely. And uh, the allocated containers is always above the pending, so the red line never goes out of control. So here is a dashboard that I mentioned earlier. So you can see the different metrics the team has been adding. We are tracking percentiles for uh, and QPS or allocations and promotions. We have a view to show us how many containers are queued, how many are paused, so that kind of gives us a sense of how much oversubscription is happening in the cluster. We are tracking locality to, to know whether we are doing more rack assignments or more off-switch assignments. And also we can see our pending and allocated containers over there. So earlier I mentioned that uh, scale testing is an expensive process. It is a long cycle. You deploy something, you generate the workload, you gather the logs, and then you start to analyze whether it helped or not. And that for us was becoming a problem. So we switched over to using SLS. SLS stands for Scheduler Load Simulator. The community already had the tool since Hadoop 2.6. And we leveraged it. We extended a little to generate workloads that kind of uh, match our workload. So now we can request a wave of allocations, like Ronnie was describing. Follow that up with a wave of promotions, and then do some uh, opportunistic allocations along the way. So using all that, we could actually mimic the workload that we had and actually see the problem happening on a one machine under our dev setup, and that allowed us to iterate a lot faster. So a big shout out to everyone who contributed to SLS. This tool has been a lifesaver. We use it for pretty much any changes we do to the scheduler or any of the other scale aspects. So with that, we can now scale a yarn to about 4,000 nodes against our workload, but how do you go to 40,000 nodes and beyond? So for that, I'll hand it to Savish. Okay. Thanks, Hitesh. So I am Savish Saklanaga. I'm the senior engineering manager here at Microsoft. So as Hitesh mentioned, first step was for us to scale Yarn to the max per a single subcluster or per single RM. And we're able to scale Yarn up to 4K nodes. The second step that we had was how do we scale Yarn to up to 40k nodes. Last year, we were here talking about YARN Federation. What YARN Federation does is it basically uh, partitions the cluster in such a way that an app can seamlessly run on the 40k nodes. So, okay, sorry. So, the high level overview of YARN Federation is as follows. So, imagine we have a set of servers in the data center. The first step about YARN Federation is to partition this cluster into subclusters. These clusters are standalone uh, clusters, which are about 4K nodes. In order to federate the application across these subclusters, we introduced three federation services. The first federation service that we introduced was the router service. Router service implements the client RM protocol. It's a sta stateless service which, ra which runs behind a web. When an application submits a request to the router service, router service uses something called as the policy store. This is the second service that we introduced, which has policies for the user. So basically, it says, given a user where the application can run. Now, based on the policies, routers, uh, router service submits the request to a subcluster. When the application starts, 
application starts heart beating into a new component that we introduced, which is called as AMRM proxy service. It's a per node manager component, and it intercepts all the calls between RM and NM. It implements the AMRM protocol. As soon as the application heartbeats into AMRM proxy, the federation interceptor kicks in. This is the uh, interceptor, this is the last interceptor in the AMRM proxy that is responsible for federating the AM, AMRM proxy protocol. So what this does is it uses something called as UAM pool and a smart policy. So whenever you want to do an allocation on a different subcluster, UAM federation receptor uses UAM pool to create a new unmanaged AM to talk to other subclusters. In this case, it would create UAMs to talk to subcluster two and subcluster three. Now, once the UAMs are created, based on the, when the allocation request comes from the AM, the federation receptor uses smart policy, which is a policy that runs and figures out where to place the containers. I'll talk a little bit more about this in my next slides, but this is mainly used for load shaping. Once the allocation request comes back from the YAN RMs, then OAM can start containers on these nodes. And this is the way we could scale AMs uh, across all the subclusters. Before I go into the production challenge that, that we hit when we are doing federation, I want to just give an overview of our main workload. Our main workload is scope, we have around 4K QPS as on an average. We have 10K max. Node locality is extremely important to us in a given DC, and the content allocation sh should be less than five seconds. So when we deployed federation to prod, we had a couple of challenges. Uh, here I'm talking about the only the top three challenges that we hit. First thing is the load shaping, cluster maintenance, and log management. Load shaping. What does load shaping really mean? Like if you think of our scope workload that runs millions of vertices, we have to be extremely cognizant of how to partition this load in such a way and forward the request to the given some subclusters so that we don't overwhelm the RM. Because from the RM numbers, we know that we can scale up to 4K nodes for our, our QPS. Also, the services that we have should be extreme, are extremely latency sensitive. Now, first thing what we did was in the smart policy was that was that what uh, sorry in the smart policy what I was talking about in the previous slide, one of the smart policies is the broadcast policy. When we started our federation, our main goal was to have very good performance. So with smart, with broadcast policy, what it does is as soon as the AM heart beats into the federation interceptor, the smart policy is to create AMs to all its subclusters, and whenever allocation request comes. It used to broadcast the allocation request to all the subclusters, and whoever comes first, it used to return back. Obviously, this had very good perf numbers. But when we deployed to production, we saw a couple of issues. First thing was, it increased the RM QPS a lot. So the reason why the RM QPS was increased is because we create unmanaged AMs for all the other subclusters, and also the way the broadcast quality works is because, because we are duplicating the request and forwarding to all the uh, subclusters, the QPS went up. Second problem that we had with broadcast policy was the cluster utilization. So since we duplicate the request, the only way to release the request is by releasing it. So when application asks for one container, we used to get around like 10 containers from 10 different subclusters, and whichever we comes first, we used to take it, and then we used to release it back. So obviously, this had uh, cluster utilization issues for us. So to solve this, we introduced the new policy, which is called locality multicast policy. Policy. What this locality multicast policy does is it creates UAMs only when on demand and only when it's really required. For instance, when our application master asks for a container on a given subcluster, this guy figures out where this node belongs to and which subcluster. But if you really think of it in production environments, it's really difficult because of the nodes can be moving. So once this figures out where the sub allocation has to go, it creates a UAM for only that subcluster and forwards the request there. With that, we hit some issues because a subcluster can be down, an RM can be failing over, a lot of things can happen. The way we solve that problem by, is by doing allocations for the subcluster on a given rack. So imagine we have a rack and we have three subclusters in that rack. 
So this local, locality multicast policy broadcasts the request only to those three subclusters, not to the entire world. Whoever comes first, based on the rack, based on the node, and based on the headroom, we are able to uh, we're able to stitch it up and send it back to the AM. And this uses allocation ID. Uh, we can also this uses allocation ID to stitch, and we can use headroom to do better placements. Cluster maintenance. Uh, because of our scale, cluster main, just maintaining our cluster was extremely dif difficult for us. Our DC has constant machine movements. And around a 40k node machines, we have around 13 subclusters, which sums up to around 52 YAN RMs if you take the master slave configurations. Now, just searching for, just maintaining these clusters, and because we have a lot of machine movements, and we also keep decommissioning the racks and moving machines around, was difficult. So, to solve this, we introduced a new component called subcluster manager. This is a component that runs, this is not a YARN component, this is a component that runs with YARN to make sure that we don't over-subscribe over some of our subclusters. It does three main things. It does node to subcluster mapping. In the previous slide, when I was talking about the locality multicast policy, one challenge that we had in prod was to figure out where this node really belongs at any given point of time. So this is the guy that maintains that mapping. So when the locality multicast policy asks this guy to say, where is my where allocation request came for a node, tell me where this node is, which subcluster. And it resolves to a subcluster and forwards the request to that subcluster. And it does dynamic balancing. Second point is it does dynamic ba balancing of subcluster capacity. What uh, dynamic balancing means is if you have a lot of overloaded capacity in some subclusters, it can move, the subcluster, move some nodes to a different subcluster. It does this by something, a concept called as NM maintenance mode, which is mainly draining the containers and pushing the nodes to different subclusters. This is not like a node restart, because one key point here is when you make the node manager heartbeat to a different RM, it kills all its containers, because they, that RM has no clue what these containers are. But at the very high level, this is how it works. So we have a subcluster manager in our cluster, and we have two YARN subclusters. Now imagine we had the third YARN subcluster. Now the subcluster manager, based on its algorithm, figures out saying, I have to do some draining, and I have to move some nodes. So it calls into the node managers and puts them into something called as maintenance mode. Once it puts into maintenance mode, the node manager starts draining the request. What it really means draining is it doesn't take any new allocations to it. The existing containers are just left there to finish. Once all the containers are finished, so the, so the subcluster manager can now pivot this to the new subcluster. At the very high level, this is how um, the machines uh, are added, and this is how the cluster maintenance happens. Log handling. Because of our scale, log handling is one of the biggest problems that we had. We generate around two petabytes of logs per day, and we have around 2.5 gigabytes per hour per machine logs. To solve this problem, we did four very high-level things. One thing is we introduced a custom log aggregator, which works with our scope AM to keep logs only for critical path containers and fail containers. Critical path containers are containers that actually slow down the job. Like for instance, when our scope AM runs millions of vertices, we don't have to keep logs for everyone. It doesn't make any sense having and managing so many logs. So we only create critical path containers and failed, of course, because we have to debug the containers. The second thing that what we did was, from the customer point of view, now the customer had to get log aggregated things. We introduced on-demand log aggregation. So we don't do log aggregation when the container finishes. The customer can come at a future point, up to seven days is our SLA, and he can run this tool and it will give us the logs for him. Third thing what we did was, for the yarn logs itself, it was very difficult for us. Like imagine debugging uh, a million job vertices on one YAN RM. And now we have 13 YAN RMs. You had to know which RM was mastered at which time, what to do, how to search. So we built a tool, call, a tool called as Helios, with internal code name, which indexes YAN logs based on uh, key value pair. So we have keys like for allocation ID, container ID, application ID, and some, or some of the keys were usually used for debugging. And this guy indexes it. And whenever a life set happens or whenever you want to see what happens to the job, 
we, j we have a predefined template, we push it to it, and then that shows exactly what happened to this entire application end to end. Last but not the least, we have we introduced scope AM aux service. This is an aux service in the node manager that keeps some key container statistics. One of the key container statistics that we have that I want to call out is, for instance, when this container ran on this node, we wanted to know who was the master RM and to which subcluster this node belonged to. Things like that are already kept in Node Manager for us with this aux service. So when we want to debug for live sets, it's very easy for us to go figure out what to do next. Next steps. So we, like, we are investing in a lot of areas. The three major areas where we are investing is mainly in the scalability side. We are scaling YARN across data centers. Now we're able to scale up to 40K nodes now across data centers, which introduces a lot of policy decisions that we have to make. Virtualization is one more place because if the container, if we are able to get 1% utilization gain, it's millions of dollars for Microsoft. And operability for obvious reasons because of subcluster uh, cluster maintenance, log management, and, uh, and we are also looking for ATS v2 and seeing whether it can scale to our needs. We are fully committed to YARN and open source. We have, we have taken a lot of code from open source. We are contributing a lot of code back. These are umbrella JIRAs and very high level JIRAs that we have committed and that we are in progress. We also want to give a shout out to the community. The community has been extremely generous to us. We are, they have helped us code review, fix bugs, like help us investigations, do design reviews, and whatnot. So to conclude, Guys, we are running the biggest YARN deployment in the world. Like, it's an amazing experience for us to come to work every day and push YARN to limits and figure out where it breaks, doing scheduler improvements, and pushing it to the next level and working on the cutting edge. We are growing very fast. We are projected to go up to 5x next year. We are onboarding a lot of OSS workloads, and it's very interesting to see how it works with our workloads, what else we have to do in YARN to support all this. And to sum it up, we have come a long way from where the YARN was with uh, four, uh, around uh, 400 QPS to where we are today up to 10K max QPS. And our journey has just started. With that, I would like to thank everyone for attending. And thanks a lot. And we are open to Q&A now. Any questions? So, I'd like to open for any yeah. QA. Go yeah. ahead. So you mentioned virtual clusters. Uh -huh. what's, what's the story behind those? Uh, so the question was, uh, what, what is a virtual cluster and what's the story behind it? So virtual cluster are uh, a concept that we had before we started the migration to Yarn. And effectively, they were just a way for our customers, they don't have to deal with any deployments or any server or anything like that. All they come to us and say, I want the ability to run up to 10,000 containers. OK, here's your virtual cluster with 10,000 containers. And then we just do admission control to make sure that whatever they submit doesn't exceed that 10,000 container at any given point in time. So that's effectively it. It's also a security boundary, so you can mount uh, the file system to that virtual cluster, and you can share mount points across VCs if you wanted to do that. So, so that, that's kind of a little bit of uh, that. And so we, when we move uh, our system over to Yarn, we maintain that uh, specific uh, semantic of a virtual cluster. Right. Right. <laughs> we don't right now. It's a very good question. Actually, the question, let me repeat the question. The question is, how do we manage queues across federated subclusters? So, uh, yeah. So currently, what we do is we are not using YARN queues to manage the capacity. We have our old system as a job service system. So we have our own queue mechanism there in Microsoft, So which does very similar to YARN. But since it's built on top of YARN, it can maintain, it can do management for the entire cluster. Basically, this component maps to this concept of virtual cluster that you're, you're asking. And so because mentally the model is still you map these VCs into queue, but we have a centralized admission control that oversees them all, 
that, that does the, the, the queue management, if you will, but each subcluster is not. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're happy to actually hear the discussion after this meeting and figure out how good ways that we could solve that problem. So the, the, yeah. the question is what's the path forward with opportunistic uh, containers and, glo and which the global schedule. The global global schedule. So, yeah, so go over. Right. So for the global schedule, uh, we are looking forward to all the improvements there. I think uh, th those are the things that you would like to try on and start using. There are a lot of good improvements. We kind of worked around them. We, we, we didn't try to solve the locking issues or any of the, like, go towards a design of heartbeat less scheduling. But that's what's coming in 3.0. So we look forward to picking them up and seeing if they can work at our scale and start using them. As of opportunistic, so currently opportunistic containers like Ronnie called out in his uh, presentation, they are allocated from the YARN RM, but they do not follow the regular scheduler path. So one of the reasons was to minimize the overhead on the scheduler, but as the scheduler is scalable, I think there's an option on the table to say it can potentially follow the same code path. And, and there's an opportunity to like distribute the queues. That's something that we're actually exploring as well. That if you actually submit the opportunistic container to your RM, he can see how the sizes of the queues are and make an informed decision of maybe it's worth sending this one to this location or that one. So we're also exploring that as well. Question. Let, let me just repeat that. Yeah. The, the question is when we introduced time based uh, locali locality, sure, sure, how sure. did that affect? So, this will be the last question because it ends at 1 o'clock and there's a lunch break for me. So so okay, okay, can, yeah. We can still stay okay. around, guys, All right. in the hallway. Okay. Just, uh, uh, so, how time based affected our locality, locality. decision, basically? So, like uh, Ronnie called out, in scope already has a view of the world, and based on various heuristics, it generally makes a good quality decision on where it needs to run. It's collecting data via some auxiliary service and whatnot to know what's the load on the machine. So, when it says, I want to run on that machine, there is a good possibility about, I think, 99? 95. Okay, 95% of the time, it's going to make a right call. So what we were finding is that we needed to make sure YARN RM can actually also sustain that quality of decision and uh, doesn't regress it. So now because of, the, because of having a time decay, we don't spend as much time. We can do a better scheduling because we can span across more heartbeats. We can look at more heartbeats, look at what's happening across more nodes, and that helps us give a better locality. Yeah. To add to that, um, so ne the way the YARN RM is written when it uh, does mit missed opportunities is basically first it's, it counts the node heartbeats. So imagine you have uh, like 100 nodes and your missed opportunity in interval is like say 10 nodes and after 10 nodes you can fall back to rack. Now if that 199th node never heartbeats in that first 10 thing, you'll never get that container. So the time based thing, what happened was we are giving enough opportunity for all the nodes to heartbeat. In, in like it, it's like high so level, that's what happens. To, to, be, to be frank, it also helped us reason a little bit more about uh, uh, what do we give in terms of a guarantee for latency because first of all, our clusters change size all the time. So if, if you think about it, really yeah. the opportunities, which is what just heartbeat, is a proxy for the time it takes a node, a RM, to receive the heartbeat from that node. It's just that it's a harder parameter to set if your cluster changes all the time. And if the heartbeats, for whatever reason, take more time to be processed by the YARN-RM itself because it's stuck in something. And so with the time base, you're just independent of whatever the load is happening in the cluster. And so you avoid congestion collapse at the same time. If someone goes a lot to one node and that node tends up to be busy, you lose a lot of opportunities. So that's a lot of that intuition that went into changing uh, from a fixed number of heartbeats over to time based. So I think it was the last question, but we're yeah, definitely we can, excited we to take a lot more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're in, uh, and share with you guys, we'll catch up out of the hallway or even on lunch, yeah. and uh, we'll be able to, to chat a lot more. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.